Hi, everybody. We didn't plan that out. We really didn't plan sort of much about this, in fact. So this is going to be a conversation more uh, than anything, I hope. Um, it is fun to have two friends sitting next to me. Uh, they're also partners in my, in my old incarnation, my new incarnation, um, which is a really fun thing to be part of. Um, I would note that uh, as we sit here today talking about uh, succession in a VC firm, we have my friends here that are working through and processing that now. Uh, I'm at Foundry Group where we've decidedly said we're not going to deal with that issue. It's literally turned the lights off uh, when we're done. And I think my partners may have brought me on to be the one that flips that switch. Um, uh, we're sitting, uh, thanks to the Upfront gang uh, for having us, but we're sitting uh, with a group that has gone through their own transition. So, uh, you know, as we were prepping for this, as I was thinking about, uh, do LPs actually even care uh, about this topic? Andy and Fred and I felt like we could have covered it in maybe 90 seconds um, quickly. Uh, it's interesting to me to note that these two are willing to come on stage and talk about this. Uh, most GPs, I think they need a, a, a gentle laxative before they'll even begin to think about things like this. Uh, much less get on stage and talk about it. So thank you uh, to both of you for being up here and doing this with me. Um, as I think about transition, why LPs might be interested in this subject, I think it's a little bit like NASCAR fans. Like they like the race, but they really want to see the wrecks. And, and, and I think honestly, that's a, a lot of what people want to hear about are the smoking wrecks of firms. And, and that is certainly the case. Um, in this case, I want us to focus on the positive and not name names necessarily, but to think about the alignment and the incentives. It's my favorite topic when I do diligence on new firms, um, but also in the case of a transition. So uh, I'd start off by asking both of you in your experience, how often have you seen this work? How many examples are there in the market that you looked at as, as models for your own transition? Well, uh you know, I think there are, particularly in Silicon Valley, uh, there are a handful of firms that have stayed in the top tier uh, for two, three, four generations, and those franchises are re really, really powerful franchises as a result. Um, and I think every LP would want to be able to become uh, an investor in those those firms and, and those funds. So. It may not be a lot that you can say have done it well, but I think we can say that the ones who have done it well uh, have seen massive benefit from doing it well. There was a, a quote yesterday, or maybe it was this morning, that came out about the Sequoia transition, so timely for us to talk about. Uh, my favorite quote was, uh, Disru disruption is at the heart of our business. It's what creates opportunities for the entrepreneurs, and it's what helps them produce great returns for the LPs. Ironically, it's also the force that many venture capital firms resist, often contributing to their own decline. Do you, do you agree with that quote, that they resist it and, it and it ultimately affects them negatively? Maybe, but you know, Andy should talk about, I mean, we have a number of companies in our portfolio that are uh, reimagining how you know, startup capital should be invested. I mean, Andy's on the board of a company called CircleUp. Well, I think that, you know, I don't know if, when, when, we, when we at USV talked about transition, I don't think we said, we need to disrupt our model. We, we do invest in companies that we think will disrupt our model. We hope to profit from them. But I don't think we discussed us disrupting what we do. In fact, I think we tried to do it, we tried to, we talked about it as a glide, actually. Yeah, I, 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 I guess maybe just to, to uh, uh, say a little bit more on that. I, I don't think that succession is disruption. I think, if anything, succession is sustaining. Right? You, you know, uh, when I look at the firm today as Andy and Albert are running it, it doesn't look very different than the firm, you know, for the 12, 13 years that Brad and I ran it, you know. So I think, I think what I believe is going to happen is, is that their leadership will sustain what makes USV unique in the marketplace. And so I think it's sort of anti-disruption, if anything. I mean, it's interesting because specifically at Sequoia, they said that um, they wanted to step away to give room for that disruption versus a, a different 
argument you're making here of continuing the brand? I think what Jim Getz was saying was he was going to go away for a couple months so that Roloff Ro <laughs> and Alfred could, <laughs> could uh, you know, kind of make some decisions without him looking over their shoulders. The reason I'm in L.A. for two months is so that... <laughs> We, All send, the, we send Fred to L.A. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was Get one of the, you know, I crowdsourced questions, and one of the questions was, are, you know, is, is there going to be a USB L.A. office that's opening up soon? So that, was, that, that came on a tweet earlier today. <laughs> Unless you include, you know, my kitchen, no. <laughs> uh, on the opposite side of the coin, how many, um, how many bad transitions have you seen out there? Um, or transitions that should have happened and didn't. I think it's I think it's the latter that's the most troubling. When the people who who started the firm stay too long, keep too much of the carry, um, fall asleep in meetings. It was literally written in that article, the Sequoia article, that Don Valentine, when he passed the baton to uh, Mike Moritz and Doug Leone, he referenced colleagues of his, peers of his, falling asleep in, in board meetings or, or pitch meetings. And I have seen that. I mean, I have seen that. And it is, it is just this horrible moment. You're like, is, is he falling asleep? Holy <laughs> shit, he's falling asleep. You know, and you don't want to be that person, so. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so let me, I, I play this role well, but let me play the role of cynical LP. So um, there are a couple of different ways that you could approach this conversation. Many firms just deny it and don't have the conversation, don't have transparency. But, but as a founding GP, isn't it difficult or why would you transfer economics, meaningful economics or leadership of, of what's your baby? It's the thing that you created, that you took the risk to go raise. Why would you, why would you transfer that in the first place? Well, so our model at USV is, is equal economics. So um, uh, we, we have a, usually one fund where somebody joins the firm and it's you know, not totally equal, but once uh, you're firmly you know, in the partnership, uh, everybody's equal. So when we made the decision, when Brad and I made the decision to transfer the management responsibilities to Andy and Albert, there was no econo There really wasn't an economic uh, transfer. Um, I think over time there will be an economic transfer, but it really wasn't about uh, money. It was really about who has to shoulder the responsibility of managing the team and managing the brand and uh, managing the relationships with our limited partners and, and all of that. And that's a that's a that's that, you know I got I got the best deal right. They they do all, they do all the work. I get the same economics. Like who doesn't want that That's deal? That's a good deal. Is that a is that a prerequisite though, for the ability to make a transfer like this? So that that shared economic model, because most many firms, I would say most in my experience, are not equal partnership shares. Do you think that just made it easier, or is that a prerequisite? Or Andy, how did you think I, about? I don't. I think know, it, I piece? think it made it a lot easier because the because the conversations were less about economics than about the future and what does a shared group of people want the future to be and what do Fred Fred and Brad want to do having founded the firm and so I think it made it a lot easier. It was also easy because we had the five of us have been partners together for five years now. Andy was the most recent one to join the partnership in 2012. And so the things that you care the most about, how are we going to behave in the market? What are we going to invest in? Uh, what is our reputation? What do we stand for? Like, we, didn't have to, we didn't have to negotiate those. Those were well understood and everybody is completely aligned on that. So, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of it was just a, about, um, you know, the, giving, giving the people who were doing the majority of the work the recognition and responsibility that, that they are doing the majority of the work. That was really all it really is, I think. So, so, so Andy, taking yourself, so you're the new guy, I'm the new guy in my partnership. So you're the new guy, right? I mean, but as you joined, how much, do, or is, is a generic 35 to 45 year old principal or partner somewhere else that's thinking about joining a new firm, how much does it matter that, that that culture, that strategy, that style is already so established in this case for when you joined? Or how would you counsel someone who's thinking about joining another firm 
to think about their role and equal economics and do you do they should they even be bringing up you know eventual succession when they when they go talk to would-be partners so first of all i appreciate you calling me a 35 year old thank you very much <laughs> Lyndon. there was 35 to 45 yeah, but, so, but that was so know. I, I don't you know the way i the way you know, every place has a different culture, right? And so it, it just, it happened at USV that I think that it was already a good cultural fit because I had been working with these guys. In fact, I had pitched them to invest in my company and I couldn't get them, I couldn't get them. I pitched them many times to do that. So, so there was some kind of shared interest in culture. And so the risk for all of us doing it was less about that than can we all invest together? You know, we know each other, we've worked together, can we invest together? And so it seems like one prerequisite that is a answering that question, right? On, in the first case, can you, can you insert yourself into a, into a culture that's making a set of very difficult decisions and can you work within that? That's the primary one. I think we, I think we talked about that when I joined the most and then kind of afterwards was the economic stuff. I mean, in my case, we spent over a year thinking about not that I wasn't friends and didn't know the guys and didn't know their culture, but that they had a certain way of, of working together. How did we incorporate um, a fifth wheel into that without screwing up something that was really working well? Did, was that, did you guys spend time on how you would work together and defining roles in advance or was it, no, I just want to be, I want to be part of that. I know them well enough. Let's, let's just, we'll figure out the economics. We'll figure out the roles. I mean, I think there was a lot, there was, there were, the relationships were fairly well established. So a lot of that could be short circuited. So it probably happened more quickly because, because of that. I think there wasn't that much of that. It wasn't that much of a curve for me at least. All right. Look, a Andy's an incredibly nice, decent, warm, caring human being. Thank you, Fred. And I'm not, and Albert's not, and Brad, on a good day might be. So we needed John, some John's of not either. So. John, John can be charming. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, you know, we, one of the things that I, I knew we needed uh, at USV was somebody who really, you know, could bring kind of a, you know, a, a, a humanity to the firm. You know, uh, at Flatiron, my partner Jerry um, always did that. And, you know, and Andy does that for us. So, you know, when, when, when we, and I remember when Brad and I brought Albert into the firm, felt like we needed a, a, like a brilliant computer scientist. And, mm -hmm. and, and among many other things, Albert is a brilliant computer scientist. So we have thought about it a little bit. And you know, obviously, one thing we need desperately is somebody who's not a white guy who's in his 40s or 50s. Um, but you know, hopefully, we can Same do here. that, too. <laughs> yeah, you, you need one, too. We're very cognizant of that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, when, when I think there's a lesson in and what we're taught, where we're ending up talking about is how to join a partnership. And the lesson in getting succession right may be in getting the right partners in the first place. Um, and, and as you think about this, in this world of crazy fund formation that's out there right now, uh, I recently told um, a principal uh, at a firm that uh, was making great money, um, kind of 35-ish year old person, had good, enough experience and, but he did had zero visibility in the management company, couldn't get his investment decisions done. Um, I mean, we had a long conversation. I counseled him to go create his own culture and because he, I felt like he was in the wrong culture. Is that something that, that you, sh you spend more time on, the culture issue and getting the partnership right in the first place? Um, or maybe did I counsel him wrong? Maybe he should have stayed and made the great current comp and you know, had his piece of the carry. Well, I, I don't know the specifics of the situation, but I want to go back to something that you said, which I think is very insightful, which is succession is easy if you have a really good partnership. And I think in our case, that's right. And the other thing that I think uh, is true in our case is that we had two people running the firm and we have two people running the firm. Uh, and I think two people running a firm is in some ways better than one person running a firm. And you know, Brad and I are very different. Uh, Albert and Andy are very different, I think, in, in, in different ways. But I think the dynamic between two managing partners is, is a really healthy one. Um, and, and I think it has served us really well. I think that, that's an interesting observation that allows you to bounce things. And I think a small partnership. Yeah. The, the larger the firm, I think the harder, the, maybe thornier this issue gets For sure. as you think about managing it. So, so it, let's take the other constituents into consideration. 
So I, I'll represent the LP side. Uh, and so as an LP, how should I think about succession? We can use your case in specific or generally, I'm concerned what makes me comfortable that those strong returns will continue? Uh, how do I diligence that? Um, you know, other than asking questions in front of a few hundred of our friends, how, how do I know that they're gonna continue on the same strategy and it should produce the same kind of returns? You wanna take a Well, I think with, with you know, you had the advantage of that with USV because it was the same group of people. We just kind of shuffled the chairs around a little bit. And so you knew enough about, about the way we're, by the way, you still ended up doing more due diligence. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so it gave you guys an opportunity to do due do, do, do diligence. And so uh, to me, it's like, you know, can you, can you ascertain whether a group of people you know, how they make consensus or how they make decisions, you know? And so you, with us, you knew that. But if it's a new group of people, you're kind of questioning them about the decision making and trying to understand how those interactions work. Again, it was easier for us because we just moved the chairs around. If we ever added someone, it would probably be a different type of analysis. But we'd do that analysis first amongst ourselves. How did you communicate, or I guess who raised the question first? So was it, was it something that Andy, you brought up, or that Fred, you brought up first? or? How did the conversation begin? Um, I think it was, I think it was a conversation that started with tiptoes and then kind of grew louder and louder and louder and was, uh, I think, ultimately brought to a head with the decision to raise our 2016 fund. The truth in the venture business is the hard decisions are made when you raise a new fund. I mean, that, that's, it's like, yeah. like, like in the startup business, the hard decisions are made when you have to raise a new round. Yeah. Um, and so I think it was, you know, it was a, there was a question about uh, whether or not, you know, Brad and I could continue to, you know, be the, the lead, you know, partners in a firm. Uh, and, and I think we just realized that the sooner that we put that issue on the table and figured it out, the better off we would be. And, you know, Albert had been by, the, by we, we had this conversation with our limited partners last year, so Albert had been a partner for eight years and Andy had been a partner for five years, maybe nine and five years, so it was certainly, they were well known to everybody and it was, I think, a relatively uh, straightforward and I think everybody kind of realized it was the right time. Didn't make it easy because uh, you know, there, there were some conversations that were, were difficult, but um, I think it was probably easier than most firms to make the decision. One LP commented to me that um, perhaps you communicated almost too strongly and too early in their view, so that it kind of threw LPs off uh, by being fairly public about it, um, as you, cause you knew it would get out anyway, I'm certain. Like, would you change anything about the way that you guys communicated to LPs? Um, and we'll get to entrepreneurs in a minute, but would you change anything about how, how you, you sort of did the, had the conversation and how early did you have that conversation you know, in advance of the fundraise? It was, I mean, I think to, for us to change the way we do it would involve us changing the way we do everything. <laughs> so our communications with our LPs is the same when we communicate with the world. You know, it's no different, and so we 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 overshare more than undershare. I think the I think we had been talking about it before we talked to the LPs for probably a pretty long period of time. It wasn't like intense the whole period of time, but it might have been almost a year, or six or nine months. We were, you know, we had been having conversations, you know, and then it was clear that we were going to make some change, and then we and that was the time we were like, let's just tell the LPs right then, you know, and then figure out those details. But that's always been our style anyway on anything, and I don't think that would change. The funny thing is that the people who reacted the worst were our portfolio company CEOs. Yeah, so let's take it from their perspective. How did you communicate to them? Poorly. <laughs> How should you have communicated to Better. them? Better. <laughs> Would you give an example, please? Yeah, well, they, we... they, 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 they had heard Fred was retiring. Yeah, and they, they had to jumped hear, all, they they had to hear it. it in the market that I yes. was retiring, and then at our CEO summit, we got ambushed by them. And they, we do no. this thing at our CEO summit where, at the end of the day, this is you know, most people in the room are, are VCs um, and limited partners. So they probably know we get our entire portfolio company together once a year, and and that the uh, for a whole day, and then there's a dinner event, and the last session of the day, 
we leave the room and, and the CEOs all talk about us and then we come back in the room and they give us feedback and they just, they just, just were so angry at us for like, you know, plotting this change and not communicating it to them. So they we destroyed us. <laughs> they, so they I was going to start. Down. They knocked us down. Yeah. It was humiliating. I was going to start today with like, looking at a friend and saying, so now that you're retired, you know, you're playing golf, you're napping every day. You know, the, how did you everything's, know that? everything's how you, open, how right? How do you know that? I have good diligence. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> He's got my phone tapped. Yeah. What's your foursome on Friday? I have a Friday. I do I have a Friday do. force, and they're in the room. I think. I think every one of the VCs that I play golf with in LA is here in the room. But we did. But but they. But they. But in all all seriousness, that we we went back in the room, and they're like, "How could you guys change the structure of the firm and not talk to us about it?" This is where I realized. I wrote a little bit about this on my blog today. I realized that they that the portfolio companies have way more invested in our brand than I knew. Like, I, I mean, you would think, I've been doing this for 30 years, you would think I would know that. And I, I just, I didn't, I really didn't understand that. And they were just terrified. Uh, not that I was retiring, but like that things were gonna change at USV and- Or, the, or that USV was going away. That's yeah. one of the things they said yeah. too. They're like, you guys are shutting this down. What is that, the fuck, what are we gonna do? You know, you're a lead <laughs> investor. Yeah. So, so how would you change that? I mean, what, if you could go uh, back, what, we should what have would done, be the advice to your what, friends in the audience? What we should have done was the minute we started talking about it with anybody other than the five of us, we should have then said to each of the five of us, go talk to each one of your CEOs that you're working with and, and just explain to them what's going on, assure them that nothing's going to change, that's going to impact them, and, you know, uh, and, 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 not, not let them, I mean, it's the classic example. You don't want anybody to hear something, you know, on TechCrunch when you should have told them, right? I mean, that's the number yep. one rule in life. So, <laughs> the number one rule? Well, I don't know if it's the number one rule in life. I'll take that back. Oh, yeah. It's but a rule in you life. kids, right? <laughs> that's what you taught them? <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I guess as, as I think about it, um, you, one thing you emphasized to me in person was, that it's really not the LPs that are the most important uh, piece of the puzzle, that you really was your entrepreneurs that you should have communicated with the most strongly. Um, and look, and, and LPs probably at the same time, um, you know, I, from my own, from the outside, watching you guys go through this, I, I, I think it's your style, Fred, to, to kind of come out strongly and say something and throw it down um, and then get a response to it. And, and and I think you very strongly said the way you said it in the in your delivery of, of the message via blogs or in person was Fred is retiring this is really the natural conclusion of the style which you in which you delivered that message and I think there was a lot of blowback um, and we heard that so I think messaging is a big thing that a learning that I think we'd probably take um, from your own example I want to hit two more things before we end our, our time one is Future tense, how do we think about both um, changing so that you can um, do less falling asleep in meetings every year? Um, how do we adjust the economics? Is it decision making? Is it investments? Uh, how do you change the culture? Andy, I want you to answer maybe first, how do you add a partner? If we're gonna continue this thing, how do you add a partner? What do you, what do you think about and what discussions do you wanna have with them um, along this path? So really good question. I don't know. I don't know if we know yet, but we know I think the things I think that we have a good sense of of what we're good at and part of that is the is the conversational culture and the consensus based approach So someone would I think could only work well if that's the way they operate if there's someone who is more of a lone wolf or a singular decision, right? So we have a strong sense I think of what the culture is so I think we would have a good sense of who could fit in that culture at the same time I think we're aware that we're pretty we're kind of a monoculture you know? and so you know it's a great way to put it <laughs> you know what happens to monocultures and agriculture right they don't survive and so we i think we we recognize that and so we you know we kind of want to push ourselves there too because we think that's a deficiency that we have and how and how do you push fred all the way out the door now that you've wrested the title from him he's in la it's okay <laughs> well i do think it's a, i think there's a responsibility for me and for brad to um 
understand that over time, you know, our influence will wane, our economics will decline, and and that new people will come in and and they will, um, you know, need to be able to, you know, have the carry that they need and, and the influence that they need to have, and, and we got we got to make room for that. But you know, it's interesting in the article about Sequoia today. I noticed that Jim was going to go away for two months and then he was going to come back and just do deals. That, that's what I want to do. I mean, I I want to I want to continue to do deals, but I don't want to um, I, I don't want to you know have some sort of shadow control over the firm anymore. A, and that's a challenging thing. So I think I have to be aware of that, and I have to you know one of the feed, one of the feedback that Albert gave me. Um, uh, this fall was that I still am dominating meetings, which is something I do. It's it's you know it's it's not a, it's not good, I, and, and, and I wouldn't say that something I'm proud of. But I tend to take over meetings, and he's like, you just got to stop doing that. And you know, so I've I've been very you know aware of that. I've been trying to not do that, which is hard for me. So, and that's those are the kinds of things that I have to do in order to make this transition work. It's not just about taking less carry, and, and we will take less carry in future funds, but it's also about um, letting other people rise in, in the culture and having us, you know, dial it down. I'm going to close with uh, a question that you were asked last year uh, at this conference. And despite your... Did I, did I curse? Despite your very public <laughs> exhortations uh, that Uber go public, do you think Uber should go public in 2017? I think every company in our portfolio that can go public should go public in 17. So every, everybody should go public? I think we should just have a public party. We should We're all, go all going to go IPO this year. All right, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you all. Yep. Thanks, guys.